imagine. Imagine how individuals can change the world. Imagine how individuals together can change the world. Imagine how you can change the world. I believe that it is all about circles and centers. Centers of meaning, circles of activity. What I'd like to do with you today is have a conversation that explores how this center becomes this. How does our purpose manifest itself? How does our source become our center of activities? Now, I'm working with the assumption that whatever I'm going to say, you already understand. So as a friend of mine says, it's what you learn after you know everything that counts. You guys already know everything, right? So we're looking for one thing. What is the one thing that you want to take away from this conversation? That's what we're looking for. Now, as an Irishman, I need to give you a heads up. I'm provocative and I'm passionate. I could break into song or dance at any moment. <laughs> I'm provocative because I don't want to impress you, I want to impress upon you that transformation is happening and you are the leaders of that transformation. And I'm passionate because I believe what individuals can do. So as a guiding frame for my work, it is the quote that says, I hear, I forget. I see, I remember, I do, and I understand. What we're going to do is you guys are going to remember because you're going to see what I'm drawing. Now, what can we do in a room like this? We can have conversations, which we're going to have at the end of this. Also, you, what you can do is you can draw what I'm drawing. There's statistics that say you're going to forget 95% of everything I say unless you write it down. How much? You see, she wrote it down. You see that? Please make marks. Please make marks so you remember what is important to you. And the other thing that we're going to do together is we're going to use our voice. I'm going to be provocative. I'm going to ask you to say stuff back to me. We're going to start. There is an island community in the South Pacific where their native language, within their native language, they don't have a word for hello. Instead, when you meet somebody, you say, you are here. And their response is, yes, I am. Now, I'm going to say three times, you are here, and you're going to play the game. You're going to play the game to say, yes, I am. Are you ready? You are here. Yes, I am. You are here. You are here. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Now, I'm not sure how engaged you're going to be, so I'm going to continue with a story. One of the things that I find fascinating is how a lot of our new knowledge could be considered old knowledge. So, look at this. In Japan, there is a bridge. Specifically, it's in... Tokyo, Japanese flag. It also represents a bridge. In the center of this bridge in Tokyo, there's a piece of metal and it represents zero kilometers. Because this was the point 
where all great journeys were measured from. So, as you would leave the city, and the city had its edge at this bridge, as you would leave the city, you would go on a great journey that was measured from zero kilometers. Now, of course, what has happened since then is that the city of Tokyo has expanded and grown further than this bridge, and this bridge is no longer at the edge of the city. So we could ask ourselves, what would we need to do to come back to zero kilometers? In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what are we measuring from? We all know and we all feel that we're in a time of transition. The question is, what are we transitioning to? Now, within the business world, they say, you manage what you measure. So the question is, what are we measuring? What is our zero kilometers? So I'm fascinated with how we could look at business or the world like this. Are we looking at it from the perspective of doing things right or doing the right things? Now we could imagine how we could look at business or life from the perspective of doing things right. That would be efficiency. That would be the correct use of resources, right? Well, what would happen if we look at things from the perspective of doing the right things? And how could we measure from doing the right things? You know, a question we could ask ourselves is, how do we measure progress? Because how we define progress will define our progress. You get that? What we're measuring will define whether or not we're going to be successful, ultimately. So I'm fascinated with the idea of having a conversation around what's happening here. What's happening at that point? Now, I love language and I love the roots of words. And I love the word desire. And the root of the word desire means, it comes from the Latin desire, which means of the stars. He or she who has a desire has a star that they're following. Oh, isn't that nice? That's very nice. Thank you very much. We've got a very nice from the front row here. So I wonder, what is the star that we're following? How do we define progress? How do we define what is successful? And I can tell you that if we look at this closer, this down here about doing things right is the whole industry around achievement. This in here, doing the right things, is fulfillment. Achievement may or may not be fulfilling. And we could ask ourselves, how would we be fulfilled? I would provocatively say, by doing the right things. Now, how excited are we? Yes. All right, we got a yes. from the, the front row was on fire down here. <laughs> Could I have a glass of water? Thank you very much. So, I'd like you to participate in, in this little experiment. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, that's, that's fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thanks. What I'd like you to do is I'd like to hold out your hand, be careful of the people in front of you and around you, okay? Now, I want you to close your eyes and point in the direction north. Hold out your hand and open your eyes and look around you. 
we have at least one person pointing upwards. We love that. <laughs> okay, look around you. What do you see? <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the challenge we have in an organization, in community, society, the world. How do we define our desire? Uh, by the way, according to my iPhone, North is over there. <laughs> Has everybody got North? Everybody following North? Conveniently, it's pointing to a star. So, now, you ready for this? I'm going to reveal something here, and you're going to read it, and you're going to honestly tell me what's the first thing that you read. You ready? Here we go. Has everybody read it? Okay, has everybody read Opportunity? <laughs> okay, who here has read Opportunity is Nowhere? Thank you for your honesty. How many people have read Opportunity is Now Here? All right. And how many people have a fascination for snow and say, Opportunity, I snow here? Nice. A friend of mine pointed out that one. Which one is correct? Snow. Snow. Yeah. Which one is correct? That is what the Japanese masters would call a non-question. Look at this. If we take any subject that we're dealing with in today's world, and we place it here. So if we take, for example, I'm going to speak a little bit about business talk, right? And then I'm going to come back to the individual and we're going to open back out into the world again. Business talk. Our customers, customers, their desires and needs are changing. Is that a positive or a negative thing? Both. Possibly negative, positive, both. Our competitors in our business world have become more agile. Is that positive or negative? Both. All right, we're beginning to play the game. I like it. We could continue like this, or we could take a fact. I'll give you a fact. 40% of people are now freelancing. The gig economy. Is that a positive or a negative thing? Here's the other thing, another fact. I can keep throwing facts in here if you want. Another fact, 30% of our current work is going to be automated right now. 30% of what you do can be automated. Positive or negative? <laughs> I wish it was true. <laughs> My point is, ladies and gentlemen, I am not interested in argument. Now, here's the tweet. You want to tweet something? Tweet this. Argument is a poor navigator in a complex system. Let me, re I'll say that one again. Argument is a poor navigator in a complex system. A complex system is another way of saying the world as we know it. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in the world. It's complex, there's a system. An argument is very much a closed world perspective, not an open world perspective. So I'm not interested in argument. Instead, what I'm interested in doing is this here. Now, can everybody see this red box? Is that at the front or the back? What about the green box? Sorry? Oh, the red one's at the bottom, right? Can you put it at the back or the front? Both. Can everybody see the green box and make that at the front? Welcome to the world of perception. And ladies and gentlemen, this is how fast perception can change. 
When businesses have what they call an insight, this is what happens. They make a change. And that's like any idea, and psychology is now proving more and more about this, how fast transformation happens. So, let me uh, tell you a story. I'm on an airplane, I travel a lot for my work, I travel around the world engaging with people, speaking, teaching and training. I'm on airplanes a lot of the time. I was on one particular airplane. It was crowded, it was hot, and it was delayed. And there was somebody at the front of the plane, and he was being an idiot. Now, that is a polite way of describing his behavior. He was upsetting the whole plane. We finally take off, we're in the air, and he's still being an idiot. Now, the air hostess is doing her best. She's handing out food. She hands him a sandwich. She hands everybody a sandwich. She hands him a sandwich. Takes a bite out of the sandwich. He throws the sandwich back at her. And he says, this is a bad sandwich. She picks up the sandwich. She looks at the sandwich. She looks at him. And she goes, bitch, <laughs> And gives it back to him. You see that? See that shift? You want to interview that lady, you want to hire that lady, you want to tap into that type of mindset. So, so by the way, the sandwiches were very good at lunchtime. <laughs> so, so, what I'm interested in is what we could do to stimulate that type of way of seeing the world. And what I want to offer you today are four things. These are four windows, four perspectives, four ways of viewing our world. And when I look at perception or perspectives, for me, a good perception is one that gives us more choice. A good perception is one that gives us more choice. So, let's explore. The first mind shift, now I'm calling these mind shifts, we could call these perceptions, we could call them windows. I'm calling it mind shift. The reason I'm calling it mind shift is, again, when you change a mindset, you change your actions. So, you want to change the world? Gandhi says we start with ourselves. And of course he's right. Change our thinking, changes our action, changes the world. So, mind shifts. And the first mind shift I want to offer you is around focus. What are we focusing on? Well. There's two words I want us to hold and explore. One word down here is a word called success. Now, there's a whole industry around that. And there's a word here in the center that's significance. What do you feel is different? Shout something out. What's the difference between significance and success? Say again? Substance. Oh, that's beautiful. In, in significance. Okay. Significance has more meaning. Success is abstract. Perception. Success may be brief. Oh, did you hear that? Success is sometimes yes oh but not the other way around oh isn't that interesting Ooh. these are the words that are in our environment and they influence us consciously or subconsciously 
One of the, the things that I love doing is talking with all people. And I mean all people. Old. Like old. <laughs> what used to be old when I was growing up is no longer old because I'm now that. I love talking with old people, 90-year-olds, 100-year-olds. And when you talk with old people, they talk about significance, not success. Whatever success they had in their life, it was only meaningful when it gave them this sense of significance. And the joke is, 100-year-old people never say, oh, I wished I spent more time at the office. <laughs> right? So, imagine we're talking about mindsets. This is about what we can do as an individual. And I want to talk from the individual perspective. I also want to remind you that whatever happens in here is actually the culture of a society or a company. You want to change the culture? Change the mindsets. A culture is nothing more than a collection of mindsets anyway. So, let's go further. The challenge we're dealing with here is this. Our language is not rich enough for who we are. It's not rich enough. We are bigger than our language. So an example of language would be these things here. Let me just read these out to you. I have language that I call replace this stuff, please, and reload this stuff. So replace the word human resources, please. I find that an incredibly challenging perspective on life. And um, happiness. Happiness is not big enough for the experience of life. We could talk about joy, perhaps, but happiness isn't big enough. Um, consumers. Wow, really? People consume? Is that what they are? Uh, could you imagine how we're beginning to change a perspective? Speed. You know we're obsessed with speed? Do you know the definition of speed? The definition of speed is movement with no direction. How much of our world is speed? Velocity is movement with a direction. Right? And we could go on. By the way, do you realize how much business talk is stolen from the military and sports? Strategy, military. A goal, sports. And let's keep our eye on the ball, sports. And we wonder why there aren't enough women in business. Right? Because look at how it's been framed. So, what could we do? We could reload it. The word corporate, by the way, is a beautiful word. It comes from corpus, which means body. So as an organization, imagine us being a body. Wow. And we're all a part of that body. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it? Unless you're the armpit. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to be the armpit in the corporation. Ability, practice, entropy, wow, that means inner transformation. There are words, ladies and gentlemen, that we could enrich our vocabulary, which will enrich our world. Beautiful. I get excited by this type of thing. So, let's continue. Second mind shift, it's around thinking. Our first one is, what are we focusing on? What would happen if we focus on significance? Our second one is thinking. What are we thinking and how are we thinking? Look at this. What's the difference between transformative thinking and transactional thinking? So, I love interviewing people, and uh, I also interviewed Al Pacino. I think that was in the, in the warm-up. I think that's what you're most excited about. I'll tell you that maybe at the end. Transformation, transformational thinking. The people that I interview are, uh, shall we say, leaders in various different fields. And one of the things that is common about what they do is they have a morning ritual. And their morning ritual is what I'm describing as transformative thinking, not transactional thinking. Transactional thinking is the question, how do we get more people to buy from us? Right? Operations. 
transformational thinking. Who do we need to become so people want to work with us? Do you feel the difference? You sit every morning and focus on that type of question, everything changes. You feel it? All right. So, the question, ladies and gentlemen, is not what to do, but who to be. Our world is obsessed with this, doing, doing, doing. However, all of the spiritual, literature, contemplative traditions will refer to this. Who do we need to be? When we are, we do. You feel that? That's the, that's the, that's the meat of it. So, look at this. One of my favorite stories or examples from uh, nature. When you have oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, something unique is created. Something unique comes from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, those of you who know this story, don't shout it out. For those of you who don't know this story, what is created? Give me some ideas. Say again. Alcohol. Well, as an Irishman, <laughs> if you are ever asked a question, that's usually the answer. Yes. Now, this might be the process that will stimulate that. However, the first thing is... Sugar. Sugar is formed from oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. However, sugar is not in carbon, oxygen, or hydrogen. Where does it come from? It is the combination. It is the emergent quality. This is why we work. Because, ladies and gentlemen, no matter how sweet you are, you are the oxygen. Or the carbon, or the hydrogen, but you're not the sugar. The sugar is what comes from you collaborating with other people. You feel it? So what is the purpose of organizations? The purpose of organizations is to create sweet spots. How's that as a uh, mission statement? Now, how are we feeling? We're halfway through, ladies and gentlemen. This is five meters into my ten meters. Five meters. How are we feeling? All right. Now, one of the things we're going to do now is we're going to go deeper. We're going to unroll some more content. And specifically, we're going to talk about how do we do collective action. Right? So far, that was about individuals. Now, let's talk about the collective. Are we ready? Now, I'm going to say three times. Shall we go? And you're going to say, let's go. You ready? Shall we go? Let's go. Shall we go? Let's go. Our rules have changed. Leadership has shifted from dictating to facilitating. Look at this. If you have an individual and you have another individual over here, if you can imagine they're individuals, the old world of leadership where one person dictates to the other person no longer works. Instead, what we need to do is we need to facilitate. Feel that? New form of leadership. That means that our mind shift for leadership is shifting from being an expert instead to accompanying people. An expert who's somebody who knows what to do. 
and they tell people what they should do. Accompanying people means that you have a collection of individuals who could be experts working together and accompanying each other. You feel that? The shift in attitude, the shift in leadership when you have this. And accompanying is something that is transforming the way we're doing business, the way we're running society. It's no longer top-down structures. It is a collaborative way of growing. There's a lot more I can say on how organizations now are functioning. So let's imagine. Let's imagine that we are in ancient Ireland, right? It means we're singing a lot more, dancing, probably fighting a lot more. And in ancient Ireland, there were two types of people that you wanted to be. You either wanted to be the king or you wanted to be the poet. The king you wanted to be because they ruled the people. You wanted to be the poet because they moved the people. Our world has shifted from this type of leadership into this. We need more poets, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that when we start focusing on how a king, a dictative, a dogmatic way of doing things can give way for something more meaningful. This, this is top-down, this is collective action. Now, maybe we need poet kings. We can play a little bit more with that. So, our fourth mindset is all about operations. We've got to talk about doing things, not just thinking about things. There's two words here that I love talking about. One is experience and the other one is relevance. Experience in this case refers to the idea that you are a company and you've been successfully working for 30 years. You have a lot of experience. Experience does not mean, however, that you're relevant. You get that? A lot of the work I do with organizations is to help them refocus into this independent of whatever their experience is. And of course, the empowering news of this is, even if you are young and you don't have experience, that doesn't matter once you're relevant. So this is an empowering world that we're in. Lots of ideas that we could look at here. One of the ideas that organizations are doing who have experience to move back in here. They do things like um, reinventing themselves. They do, they, they do things like um, Friday refresh, where on a Friday they sit down in teams and they say, if we were to start afresh, what would we do? Would we still do what we're doing or would we do something different? So there are mechanisms that we could put into play, into practice to make sure we're still being relevant. Does it make sense? So, what have we spoken about? We have spoken about mind shifts. Four mind shifts, ladies and gentlemen. Those four mind shifts are all about offering a perspective on the world. That's what I'm interested in, perspective, not arguments. And what I find um, interesting about it is that if we begin with the first two, these are subjective. These are very personal. What is significant for you may not be the same for somebody else. However, the second two is where you step out of yourself and you engage with others and they become objective. And you start engaging with what other people find relevant or how you accompany them. Now, of course, Four things. How do we remember them? We remember them because S-T-A 
or represents the star that we want in the middle. Star. So these little memory devices might help us realize that there are more ways in which we can see the world. That is where I wanted to get to today. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, how are we doing with time? We have 40 minutes. Or sorry, I've got 20 minutes left. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's what we want to get into. So, before I re-roll and recap, this is your opportunity for questions. Then I re-roll and then I've got a question for you. Does that make sense? So, before I re-roll and recap, what are your questions? Burning questions or tell me, how do you feel? I've enthused you. That's lovely. Thank you very much. What else? Yes, sir. We've got a question, comment, or feeling coming from this man. Yes, sir. Do you have. One second. Yeah. Just wait for the mic. Yes. Thank you. Do you have uh, an example you can give us of when you took this thought structure yeah. to an intransigent, intransigent yeah. uh, success oriented, yeah. Transaction-oriented, yeah. ruling, yeah. experienced executive, and made him yeah. inevitably change. And it, is it him? Is it? It's bound to be. <laughs> so, we each other here about uh, most of the clients that you work with as a consultant are mostly middle-aged, grey-haired men, right? And please, ladies, help us change that. Um, and what? There's a number of layers, I feel, in that question, and there could be a number of emotions in that question <laughs> as well, right? I think the layers that we're dealing with there is the resistance that individuals have to change. So that, we've got to acknowledge that. So you can't tell people what to do. So one of the structures that I always work with is I never tell people what to do. It's always about presenting possibilities and presenting examples. So that's part of the way that I would work. The second thing is that you never work with just one individual, but you work with a group of people. That's where I would always start one. Because it's not about changing one individual, it's about changing the team. Because if you can't get through that resistance of the one individual, the team perhaps can. So I wouldn't just work with a one-on-one, -on -one, I would work with the team structure. Then it's all about the culture. Is the culture agreeing to this or not agreeing to this? Because that's the next level. Because if the culture is agreeing to it and it's come down from the CEO, it's relatively easy. If it's not coming down from the CEO and the culture isn't supporting it, you're fighting another barrier there. So these are the, the kind of structures that we're facing. A lot of the work that I do is interventions. So I go into organizations and I give a speech and then I do a training and then I do a coaching dynamic. So that's the kind of uh, process. I'm not sure if I've engaged all of the emotions that are, <laughs> that are there. Yes, another question. Um, hello, my name is Samari. Um, I've got a small BMB. Let's assume that uh, hypothetical situation, we are the galaxy Captain America, Iron Man, et cetera, et cetera, in the movies. Okay, right. And Superhero then they're, they're metaphors. The Superman, yes. And they invited you to help them, and actually following up from this gentleman question, said to you that what would you actually give us to change? Because at the moment, without, in the words of uh, Omid, not to be too political, the environment outside is quite fascinating, the uh, tumultuous. Yeah. So let's say you go up there and you're asked to help them sort out in the galaxy, in Mars, and so on and so forth. Yeah. What do you be doing other than putting on I'm a different I'm not quite, group? I'm understanding your question right now. The question so is... Am I the superheroes or am I working with superheroes? You are a mini hero. Okay, I'm a mini hero. Thank the, you. The <laughs> thank you. Sometimes those, the those are the real are the heroes. heroes. So Sorry. they still invite you because... <laughs> Fine, I'm a mini hero and the superheroes have invited me, yes? Right, they invited you because they are very okay, surprised. Well, somebody guys, in hypothetically... On, somebody on Earth has got some fascinating ideas yes. that is doing to do the change. Yes. So 
the question is again, yeah. what you will be telling them and actually prescribing them to do A, B, and C yeah, other than so, the fact, yeah. Well, there's a few, again, assumptions you. you're working with here, apart from the superhero construct and Mars. <laughs> Um, one of the things is, what will I tell them? I don't tell people. I, I don't, that's again argument. I am right, you are wrong. I'm not interested in that. Instead, we go on a conversation together. So, yeah, so, and then, and then what do I suggest is a better word, right? Well, what I'm suggesting is the foundation of everything that I'm doing here, which is that it starts with an individual change and then it moves into an outer change. So that would be the concise answer to how I work and what I do with individuals. Start with the individual and then you go out. Now, what you gotta do next to that is consider the context in which you're operating within. So who are they? Oh yes, they're superheroes. So uh, we would have to figure out the context. So I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question. What we're doing is we're starting individually and we're going out to the world. That's the structure. And then I would refine that based on who I'm working with. Context is everything. Yes, another question. And then I want to re-roll and recap because I want to get into a conversation. Yes. Oh no, I did too. You were just. Uh, you said yes to someone. Who were you pointing at? I, I thought I thought that was yourself. No, maybe not. Any other questions? Burning questions? Yes, yes, yes. How do you start the process of healing when there's lots of legacy issues? How do you start the process of healing when there's a lot of legacy issues, such as the world today? <laughs> Right? Or in an organization where you go into an organization, and this was a client that I worked with last year, but I can't tell you who they were for legal reasons. They fired uh, 1,700 people before I was speaking. How do you deal with that? Right? I think one of the things that comes from psychology is you need to acknowledge the pain, you need to acknowledge the suffering, you need to accept it. Uh, embrace it, not ignore it. So we need to address it. And in addressing it, then we need to reframe it constructively, not negatively. And I would do that through a use of language. So one of my big things is dealing with language. So I would address the, the, the pain, as it were, and then use a language that is constructive to move forward. And then it's all about circles. You start with individuals and you work outwards. Again, these are great questions, guys. We could talk for quite some time just on that. And then Paul, shall I shall Paul, I reroll? Sorry, one more question yes, sir. for you um, to put to the audience. Your answer would be: uh, So, what if you're just an individual constantly working against the current? So you're an employee with a, a multinational, or even just a, an SME that yeah. that has its agenda sorted. Yeah. It's relatively rigid. Maybe has a few transformative players, visionaries, yeah. but many, you know, many kind of ossified structures. Yeah. How can this individual, yeah. many of whom may may feel that this is their profile, how would they actually feel that their actions can be significant or transformative? whilst they're swimming against the current. So, beautiful. Now, have you heard that language? Swimming against the current. It's very interesting. That means that the current is going one way and then that you're going the opposite way, right? So it's an interesting language that we're using here. For me, it's always about you start inwards and you go outwards. You be the change you want to be in the world. So it's not about pointing outwards, I wish, they should, etc. You start with yourself. This comes back into, let's say, Simon Covey. He wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Within that, you have the concept of circles of influence, which is basically you start with your zone of what you can influence and then work outwards. Focus on what you can do. And the more you focus on what you can do in your circle of influence, the greater that circle of influence will grow. So that's one perspective on this. Another perspective that I personally have on that is don't fight the system. Don't change the system. Create a new one. It is very easy to protest and break down. It is much harder to build. The real work is in the rebuilding and the design as opposed to the criticism and trying to patch up a house whose foundations may not be solid. A great example of this, by the way, was a call for an alternative through the UN and some members of the EBBF 
uh, not only submitted a proposal, actually won that proposal for an alternative to what the UN could be. And that's like global vision. Beautiful. So, shall we re-roll recap? Yeah? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, four mindsets. They are represented with a star. The star is significance, transforming, accompanying, and being relevant. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because other people need to remind us what is relevant. This is not something that we define, but something that others help us define. It is something that I personally feel we really are moving towards in the world, a different way of approaching things, a new language, a new integration of emotions. The world of business, just being a logical business, is no longer acceptable. Instead, we're moving into a new world where the concept of leadership would mean that we accompany people. This means, ladies and gentlemen, that the future of leadership is feminine. Now, I did not say the future of leadership is to be a woman. Now, if you already are or you wish to be, that's fine. <laughs> what I mean is, the old-fashioned way of leading was dictating, which is primarily a male-orientated perspective, whereas women tend to have the ability to listen, empathize, care, engage, support, question. All of those things is the skill set that we need to accompany people. So I would like to present the future of leadership as being much more feminine. And we are sorely in need of female leaders. Most of the female leaders we have in today's world are more men than men. Right? So just because somebody's leading something and she's a woman does not mean that's the model we need. We need a woman to have the ability to, well, be a woman. And just like a man needs the ability to be able to embrace this this skill set here of facilitation. So it's, it's a beautiful world that's opening up, ladies and gentlemen, and a world where I feel there's a lot of possibility because we are learning how to move towards collective action. Collective action is what we're exploring. So one of the things that we can focus on is the difference between what we're doing and who we really want to be. That's the difference. We do in the world, we do so that we think it's going to help us to be. So I'm going to do all of these things so I will be successful. Instead of being and then doing. It's a very different uh, perspective, which is the perspective that individuals who are focusing on transformative thinking work with. Now, I definitely would love to discuss more of this stuff how language is framing our world, how we describe our world is our world. So if we want to expand our world, let's expand the language that we're using. What does it mean to be significant? And then how do we shift from one perspective to another perspective? That's the kind of power that I feel will redefine what is power that ability to shift, fluidity. Opportunity is now here. So I would like to propose that our desire is to move towards what would be called the right things, the star that guides. And I would like to propose that we can redefine, we can go back and revisit what we consider as success, significance, and measuring, so that we understand what is the star that guides all of our activities. Everything I want to say could be said with a star, a dot, and a circle. Do we have more questions, comments, and feelings? Or shall I go straight into what happened when I met Al Pacino? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah? You want to hear about Al? Yeah? So I'm backstage at an event in LA as you do now. Backstage at events are never glamorous, by the way. You think they're glamorous, they're never glamorous. They kind of look like that part of the room, you know. And I'm backstage and I see this gentleman sitting on a tall chair and he looks remarkably like Al Pacino. Now, because I'm Irish, I go over and say, Hi, are you Al Pacino? <laughs> and he says, Yes, I am. And I had this amazing conversation with Al Pacino. Now, he is one of the most holistic, warm, full individuals I've ever met, and a true master of his craft. Very quickly, we got into a conversation over what drives him, who he is now, who he was. And he talked about how, when he was younger, he made a great mistake. And the mistake was, everybody knew who he was when he was younger. So he was famous. People would come up and say, hey, you're Al Pacino. And he'd say, yes, I am. And then he made the mistake of never getting to know them. And he spent year after year making all of these mistakes in his life where he didn't get to know the people that he was working with. Mistakes professionally and personally came from this. And he said his life changed when he said... The quality of relationships defines the quality of results. The quality of his relationships defined the quality of his results. So what is significant for the individuals who are 100 years old and when they're interviewed, they say two things whatever was significant in their life, and the relationships they had in their life. I'm looking forward to building more relationships and hearing about your significance. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.